Our reading is from Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flame and arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. I first began my church ministry when the charismatic movement was happening all over the world, and particularly when it was starting to um, spread in the UK. And back in those days, there was no YouTube didn't have the internet, there was no Christian TV or radio channels addressing the topic. All we had were songs of praise on a Sunday evening, and um, wisely so, they never really touched controversial topics, just the safe topics. And a lot of people were asking questions, what does the Bible actually teach about the, the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, and so forth. And so we decided to address this at Sunday evening meetings for a whole year. We said, we're just going to look at this whole topic for a a whole year. And we were only, and to see what the Bible actually teaches about it. And we were the only church in the area who was addressing the topic. One Baptist minister said to me, he said, Sean, he said, if you touch that topic, he said, you'll destroy your ministry. And I said, if I don't touch it, I'm not being true to God because we're ignoring large parts of what the Bible actually teaches us. So we have a duty to actually have a look and seek to understand what the scripture teaches about this. And so we looked at the Holy Spirit, we looked at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And my decision then was, as it is now, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens when we become a Christian. Sometimes we may have a later experience where we become conscious of it, but we actually are baptised in the Spirit at the moment we come to Christ. And the filling of the Holy Spirit is something that happens on a, on a continual basis. We looked at spiritual gifts and whether they were relevant for today and looked at how God gifts his people to equip them for for works of service. And these services, they attracted a a lot of people. People from the surrounding village churches would come, as we were the only church addressing the issue in that particular area. Gypsies from a local traveller site would come. You know, we had all these horses. We had a graveyard in the church. All these horses one night suddenly ride up outside the church. I thought, my goodness, what's happening here? And all these gypsies from the local camp, they tied up their horses to the gravestones much to the uh, anger of some of the villagers looking at these horses all over their family's graves and, and, and so forth and um, all these gypsies uh, came in to, to listen to the subject some of the people from the village came as well because it was in the national news not us but you know the whole topic of what was happening in churches at this time and so the services were absolutely packed And I found out afterwards that apparently these, um, because there's a big Christian movement amongst the travelling community, I don't know if you know that, but you know, God's doing amazing things, he was doing it then in the 90s, and still doing it now. And I found out that some of them, if if I said things they didn't agree with, they were going to stand up and say, that's not what the Bible teaches, and walk out. Then if I said another thing, another one would stand up, that's not what they, but fortunately they didn't, they actually were captivated by what I think God was speaking in those meetings. And um, they actually listened and 
talking to them afterwards, we found actually we were very close on what we understood the um, scripture to be. But as a result of these, I was asked to go into Gartry Prison to lead Bible studies on this particular topic, as they had kind of a Christian fellowship there. And I eventually became not a prison chaplain, but I became a part of the chaplaincy team. We used to go in, I think it was on a Wednesday afternoon or a Wednesday evening. Um, sometimes Melody would come in with me as well, and we'd go in with the uh, Methodist minister and the Anglican minister, who were the official chaplains. And as part of the team, we'd go into the um, prison. And I think Melody remembers those times where you were, you know, going to these oppressive places where spiritually they're very, very uh, oppressive and so forth. And I want to share, before we look at this um, passage, I want to share three particular memories and experiences with you from that time. And the first was a lady who was a part of that um, chaplaincy prison um, team. And the Methodist minister, he had invited me because he was a good friend of mine. And the first thing this lady said to me when she met me, she said, I want nothing to do with your charismatic ministry. I want nothing to do with any other char- charismatic ministry. You know, and that's a pretty ignorant thing to say because the biblical word charismatic means a divinely conferred God-given power or a talent that can inspire devotion and faith in others. So what she was saying, I want nothing to do with what God, the gifts he gives people to inspire and to enable faith in others. And I'll refer to the self-righteousness later in the message. The second thing, as I always remember, speaking to this particular man who was convicted of a a very brutal murder and I always remember the what he said to me he said Sean he said one thing I tell you he said people who've committed murder like I have and you'll have two types of prisoners some would never talk about their crimes others would actually be quite open about it and I remember what he said he said when you kill somebody like I have done he said you have seen evil face to face He said, you have literally seen the devil in your own soul. And he said, you have seen darkness. And, um, you know, those words just always struck me. And he was obviously unpacking later on what he he meant by it. And the third thing, particular memory I'll share with you this morning of those, those times, was that prison psychologists saw Christian faith as part of the problem preventing prisoners from being rehabilitated. When the prisoners would come to the psychologist for counselling and so forth, I remember these prisoners had become Christian while inside. They were telling to the chaplaincy team, they said that these psychologists, they said, you don't realise the harassment we get, that they actually see faith as part of the problem. They feel we're not coming to terms with the crimes we've done, that we're just saying, well, God's forgiven us, and it's just a, a, a cop-out. And these psychologists were actually actively trying to ban Christianity from the prisons. They were saying it's harmful to the rehabilitation of prisoners and so forth. And the point is that it's impossible to read the New Testament without clearly seeing that it does record a conflict between two different kingdoms, if you like, or two different spiritual powers, that of God and that of the forces of darkness. And to remove this element of conflict from the New Testament would lead to a major misunderstanding of the message and mission of Christ. Because in this passage we're encouraged to be strong, to stand firm, to pray on all occasions. We're encouraged to pray different kinds of prayers, including prayers of request, to pray for other Christians. We're encouraged to be alert, which means to be aware of what's happening in society, what's happening around us, what's happening in our own hearts and minds and so forth. We're told to pray that the ambassadors of the church may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because most people think they know what Christianity is, And it's often the shallow shell of unspiritual religion they have experienced, not true biblical Christianity, which is a relationship with Christ and a walk with God. And I remember one of the meetings, I just happened to be speaking at um, this meeting, but the prison governor, when they were trying to ban it from the prisons, he would come to the meetings and he would sit there to listen to what we were saying to the prisoners. And you could see him writing notes, not because he was learning, but he was trying to understand all that we were teaching the um, you know, prisoners and so forth. And it was good to know that he said to us after he'd done this for a few months, he said, I really support what you guys are doing. And he said, I can't see anything wrong with what you're saying. I think it's such a great help to the um, prisoners. But there's a reason Paul gives us this encouragement because the Bible talks about a dark power in the universe, our ultimate enemy, if you like, a mighty fallen angel and his followers, spiritual authorities, evil spirits who stand opposed to the work that God does through his people. And in this passage, the Christian life 
is depicted as a struggle against cosmic powers and, if you like, a type of warfare. And that's the reason, if you look at what Paul wrote about before he addresses this topic in Ephesians, he talks about themes of unity, harmony, diversity, purity, emphasises characteristics of the Christian church which stop these powers from overtaking us. I'll say this before we look at, because I'm not focusing on the cosmic powers this morning, it's just an introduction really, but there's two errors we can fall into as Christians. The first, we can disbelieve in these powers and ignore what the biblical witness said. That's an error because Jesus and the apostles bore testimony to their existence. But the second error is just equally as dangerous, that we can elevate these powers to such a state as not given them in scripture as we override the biblical witness and we then commit a potentially fateful error because Paul does not teach us about these things to tickle our curiosity. He's not trying to give us nice bits of academic knowledge. He's actually teaching us to warn us of their existence and their hostility and how we as Christians overcome them. And C.S. Lewis said at the beginning of the screw tape letters, and many of you have probably read that very famous book, He said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race of human beings can fall into about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence, and the other is to believe and to feel feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialistic or a magician with the same delight. So I'll just say this before we look on to um, how we as Christians don't even need to, in a sense... These things can never defeat us. I just say this. The characteristics are, they are powerful. The Bible teaches they're the cause of sin, disease and death and so forth. And biologists teach us that the human body has an immune system and that vaccination educates the immune system by introducing tiny amounts of a disease so that the immune system can learn to combat it. And so what we see in all of creation, even down to the tiniest molecules and so forth, there's a battle happening. There's a battle of life and death that happens from the international powers, even down to the minutest signs of life. It says these evil powers are destructive. They seek to undo all that is good. And it says they are cunning and shrewd. But what the Apostle Paul and Christ taught is that the power of God is stronger. Because he is omnipotent, he is all-powerful, he is all-knowing, he is um, all-present. And he teaches the goodness of God will always overcome and that we as Christians, we can actually walk in victorious power over these forces. We don't need to walk in fear of them. We don't need to walk with them affecting us. That's why he says in verse 10, we need to walk in spiritual strength and not in weakness. And so he's teaching us how to walk in God's power. That's what he says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He's teaching us how to experience God's goodness and bless him and for us to understand how to live a victorious Christian life. And then in verse 11 he says, well, we need to be strong in God's power because we're in a spiritual battle against a scheming foe that the Bible teaches is very intelligent. So if we think of the spiritual battle we're part of in this world, how do we overcome it? Well, it's very simple. Because Paul says that God has provided us with spiritual defences and weaponry to have victory in this spiritual struggle and war. It's called the armour of God, which is what he mentions in this passage. And again, it's a metaphor because the armour of God is basically the central truths of scripture that make up the spiritual defences of the Christian believer. I say that again because that's very important. The armour of God is simply this. It's a metaphor that Paul uses to describe the central truths of scripture that make up the spiritual defences of the believer. That when we understand these, these powers actually have no authority or power against us. And so, of course, he uses the Roman, um, the armour of the Roman soldier that they would dress in. But he describes us as Christians as a soldier who are engaged in a great struggle against these cosmic powers for which we must be fully armed. And that's why he says our battle is against forces that operate outside of the physical realm of our physical existence. He says in verse 13, we put on the armour of God so that when testing times come, we stand in that day and we can keep on standing. That whatever happens, whatever 
occurs in our life, we can keep standing. And this is the point of this message. Let's look at some of these truths of scripture that are, metaf- that are used metaphorically as armour. The belt of truth buckled around our waist. Do you realise that you are worthy of being loved by God and loved by others? That's exactly why Jesus came. The whole mission and emphasis of Christ coming was to teach us that we are worthy of being loved by God, that all humanity is. That there's not one single human being who God does not love. But these powers would seek to undermine that. They would seek to say, you're horrible, you're disgusting, you're this, you're that. Because as human beings, we always base our sense of worthiness or unworthiness on the past. Don't worry, we look at our past and we think, oh, I did that last week, I did that a year ago, I did that, so forth. And we build up this image of our worthiness or unworthiness based on the track record of our lives. But God bases it simply on what Christ has done and who he is making us to be. So it's always about the future. It's always about who he is enabling us to become. That's why Paul wrote elsewhere to the church of Philippi. He said that I forget what is behind. And he uses the word, he says, I press and strain on towards that which is ahead. So he's saying, yesterday, forget it. It doesn't matter. That does not define who I am. I am now defined by what Christ says about me, and that is the truth. We are to gird about our lives, that it's what God says about us, not anything else that defines who we are as people. Because our life and destiny is in the future, not in the past. The truth of who you are is in the future, not in the past. That is true for this life and also death. In this life, the future God calls us to, that's the truth of the destiny he has for us. If we die, it's only the laying down of this physical existence. We awaken to a greater existence in the kingdom of God and so forth. And I'm not going to go too deeply into that um, this morning. So what I say is the truth is, who you have been, what you have done, is unimportant compared to what you are now in Christ and what you're about to do on the journey that we are embarked upon as Christians, a journey that goes beyond this life. We have all erred in the past, but the Bible teaches it's insignificant compared to that which we press on towards, which God is calling us towards. The truth is, God forgives our mistakes, all of them, every single one of them. Our misplaced passions, our erroneous notions, our misguided understandings, our hurtful actions, our selfish decisions, all of them, Every single one of them, God forgives them. Others may not forgive you, but God does, and so do I. And I say so do I, not because I have some special power to forgive, because that's what Jesus told every Christian to do. We prayed in the Lord's Prayer, Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So we say others may not forgive you, but God does, and as Christians we should say, and therefore, so do I, because that's what Christ taught me to do. Others may not release you from your guilt, but God does. And so should we, as Christians, release people from their guilt. Others may not let you forget, let you move on and change, to go on and become something and somebody new, but God does. And so therefore, as Christians, so should we. We should look at all people and realise that God has forgotten the past. He's allowing them to move on, to change, and to become the people he calls them to be. God knows You are not what you were, but he is enabling you to become what he is calling you to be. And that should fill us with wonderful joy and hope because that's God's greatest gift. And that's basically what it means to wear the breastplate of righteousness. When we simply understand, it's not about our track record. That is how great the grace of the gospel is. It's all about what Christ has actually done for us. And it doesn't mean we can just live a life how we want, but it means that we keep trying to become and to walk in that way that God calls us to walk. But you know, some of the worst people I have met in life have been self-righteous and self-justified people. Be they Christians, atheists, agnostics, or followers of another faith. Because Jesus said about the Pharisees, he said, they swallow a camel, but strain out a gnat. And they have certain values and think everybody else should adhere to them. And I think about that dear lady who um, said those words to me 
when she'd met me the first time, didn't know, even know what I was actually teaching on those Sunday evenings, but she made that um, judgment. You know, that's a form of self-righteousness and self-justification. When people sit in judgment on others, when they condemn them, when they set themselves up as guardians of what they perceive to be right and wrong, and if other people come into their circumference, immediately their prejudice and their assumptions label them and define them and say, this is who you are, this is what I think about you. And what I say to such people, I say, stick to your beliefs if it serves you. This is what I said to the lady. I said, hold tight, do not waver, for they are different definitions of who you perceive yourself to be in God's sight and your own personal perception and understanding of who you are. Yet give others the same respect that you demand. Do not require others to define themselves by your understanding of God, your understanding of the Bible, or your understanding of yourselves. This week in the news, look at the flack Jacob Rees Mogg received for simply saying that he believed that life was sacred and that life began at the moment of conception and therefore abortion was wrong under every circumstance. And that he said that he believed that marriage was between a man and a woman. Now I don't want to delve into those ethical issues this morning but just look at the sheer flack he got just for stating what he believed to be his own conscience, his own understanding. Tim Farron, another lead politician, had to resign because of his Christian viewpoints on certain issues. The Bible says here, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against cosmic powers. That is why we should be ready to share the gospel of peace. And I'll start to draw to a close with, with this. I will bear witness to Christ... But I don't see it as my calling or our calling as a church or our commission or job to try to force or pressure people into accepting the gospel of peace. All we have to do is have our feet fitted with the readiness to share it. Sometimes simply by saying I cannot answer all mysteries. You know, sometimes people ask questions which are very difficult to to answer. Because we don't know all mysteries, we don't know everything, we are not God, we are ourselves on a continual learning curve. And I say to them, I'm still a learning and a disciple myself, so I may not be able to answer all mysteries, but I can tell you of this, I can tell you the difference that Christ has made in my life. That I'm not the person I used to be, because of who he has made me now. And our personal story and testimony is the most powerful truth we have, because it's born of our experience with divine things. I know when I became a Christian, I know how it happened by turning to Christ in repentance and faith. And I know that when it happened, the deepest truths of my life were forever altered and changed. I knew that I was no longer what I once was. I know that I am currently not who I will be. The story of the journey of faith still unravels. It's still being told. And when this life ends, we'll begin a new chapter and a new story because Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. That's why he says, take up the shield of faith. So don't close off the possibilities of new truths and deeper understanding of faith because you're uncomfortable with old ones. As Christians, we should always be willing to learn. One day, listen to this, because I'll talk about heaven um, maybe one, one day, and you'll probably be surprised that our understanding of it is quite often not what the Bible teaches is what the mythology of certain you know myths teach and so forth but the bible teaches one day every question we ever had will be answered but we still won't know everything because then there will be new questions that we will ask that we can't even imagine or perceive exist yet they're questions we don't even understand exist and so one day every question we have had will be answered But then new questions to ask that we have not even imagined um, will occur to us. And that is why we'll always be growing in eternity. And so the point of this is the true life of faith begins at the end of your comfort zone. We cannot grow in faith if in our understanding, if in our faith, our action, and our life, we stay in comfort zones. It's only when the Holy Spirit challenges our perceptions and so forth that we truly grow. And so I'll say this, to extinguish all the flame and arrows of the evil one, 
We need to carefully examine and reflect on the emotional and mental battles we have as Christians. And if we are sliding away from Christ or developing an increasingly hostile attitude towards other Christians or, or people, it's because we're allowing the fiery darts of the enemy to take root and supplant the truth that is within us, the truth that can set us free. And so finally, take the helmet of salvation. Remember what we have been and what we're being saved from. So do not be quick to judge another human being. That's what Christ taught us. Because another person's current mistakes may have been our own past actions of yesteryear. I can't condemn people in our society who do things I once done before I knew Christ. How hypocritical would that be? Another person's choices and decisions may be as hurtful, harmful, selfish and unforgivable as our own have been at times in our lives. If we cannot imagine how another person might do such a thing, could it be because we have forgotten where we ourselves once came from and what we were saved from and what we're being saved for and to? And so finally, he says, the sword, I keep saying finally, but it's because there's a couple more verses we need to address, but I'm nearly done. But he says, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, it's not to be used against people. It's to be used to help people, to heal them, to build them up. It's used as both defence and attack against the spiritual forces that would seek to undermine all that God is seeking to do in the lives of people. This is a paraphrase, my own paraphrase of what Jesus said. I think it's Matthew 5, 6. I think I'll have to check that. But he said, Behold the darkness, yet curse it not. Rather be a light unto the darkness, and so transform it. Let your light so shine before men, that those who stand in the darkness will be illuminated by the light of your being. So in closing, I will say this. As a church... We are called to carry the light of Christ. When we do, it will light our own paths. In the moment of greatest darkness, we will see the way. God will show us the way because the light will expose it and we'll see the path. It will help us to light the paths of others. And the light of God is going out in our society. I don't think we have to look far to see how the light of God and the Christian flame is slowly being extinguished. But all we have to do as the church, as Christians, is to continue to carry the light of God. Sheep are lost and must be found, so we should be the good shepherd who seeks them and leads them back home. And finally, it's a light to the world. The world is waiting for us to heal it, to show it the way, or rather for God to heal them and to show them the way through us. Not because we're perfect, not because we think we're so great, but purely because that is the gift of the Holy Spirit God has given to us amongst many others, the ability just to understand his light. And however dimly we may shine it, there is some light in us that we can shed to other people. So you are in this place, now, here, today, because whatever your circumstances, there's still much, still much you can do. It's impossible to have contact with another human being without it shaping them in some form or another positively or negatively so that's why we should pray in the spirit with all kinds of prayers and requests on all occasions and let's do that now <clears throat> heavenly father i've spoken for much longer than i usually do this morning but i feel it was an important passage of scripture to explain that we may seek to understand it so Lord, help us to realise that our focus is upon you. And in a world that at times is beautiful and glorious and wonderful and we see evidences of your creation, we also see sin, death and decay and so much evil. Lord, we cannot do everything, but help us carry the light which we can by the power of your Holy Spirit in your name. Amen.